Okay, part two of chapter 14, The Doctrine of Translation. All right, in a sermon given in October of 1841, Joseph Smith taught that, quote, translated bodies are designed for future missions, end of quote. This sets the stage for a future work that Elijah was to do in the meridian of time. Since he was translated and taken to heaven during Old Testament times, Joseph also taught that translated bodies cannot enter into rest until they have undergone a change equivalent to death, end of quote. A change equivalent to death was necessary after Elijah's translation and future mission in order for him to enter into his rest and eventually appear to Joseph and Oliver two separate times in angelic form. Of course, we cannot discount the possibility that he could return again in the third watch in some capacity. Is transmigration a doctrine of the devil? Many members of the church have been indoctrinated to believe that transmigration or the ability for the Lord to return an ancient prophet back to the earth by literally being born again is a false doctrine. This belief comes primarily from a misinterpretation of an event in the history of the church regarding Joseph Smith's encounter with a man named Joshua. In November of 1835, a man who went by the name of Joshua <clears throat> paid a visit to Joseph Smith. The man evidently had some truth, for Joseph said he made some excellent remarks. However, Joseph Smith was suspicious of him and discovered that he was Robert Matthias of New York, who had endured trials for murder, manslaughter, contempt of court, whipping his daughter, etc. Joseph entertained him for a few days and finally asked the man to enlighten him, quote, on his views respecting the resurrection, end of quote. Matthias made four observations. Number one, he, Joshua, was a literal descendant of Matthias the Apostle. Number two, the spirit of Matthias was resurrected in him. Three, the scheme of eternal life was the transmigration of the spirit from father to son. Four, he was the spirit of truth itself and possessed the soul of Christ. To this, Joseph Smith said, quote, I told him that this, his doctrine was of the devil, that he was in reality a possession of a wicked and depraved spirit, end of quote. Joseph pressed him to leave, and upon his departing, he said, quote, And so I, for once, cast out the devil in bodily shape, and I believe a murderer. End of quote. When Joseph Smith told Joshua that his doctrine was of the devil, there's no reason to believe that Joseph was categorically referring to the doctrine of transmigration. He was obviously referring to the false beliefs that, quote, The scheme of eternal life was the transmigration of the spirit from father to son. End of quote and the other points listed above that pertained specifically to Joshua. He was possibly also referring to Joshua's claim of being the literal descendant of Matthias. Nothing that was said in this account within the history of the church proves that transmigration is a false doctrine or that Elijah the Tishbite, who was translated and taken to heaven in a chariot of fire, could not have been transmigrated as John the Baptist. Indeed, it actually provides support since Joseph did not take a stand against the doctrine of transmigration. <clears throat> transmigration versus multiple mortal probations. Precious little has been revealed about the doctrine of translation. We know it represents temporary change which makes it so that death has no power over the person during that state. Some might postulate that a translated body cannot be torn, born into another mortal body. But that assumption appears to be the translated souls are spiritual beings who can take on a physical presence, but are not necessarily physical beings in the sense that mortals are. We know from Jesus' appearance to the twelve in the upper story that his resurrected body was physical and yet it could dematerialize in some mysterious way to go through a solid wall. Would that not indicate that a translated body might be even more of a spiritual substance that could be used to annihilate? animate a mortal tabernacle? We just don't know enough to make any conclusions. The following two statements by Joseph Smith could be providing significant clues. In a sermon given in October of 1841, Joseph Smith taught that translated bodies are designed for future missions. This sets the stage for a future work that Elijah was to do in the meridian of time. Since he was translated and taken to heaven during Old Testament times, Joseph also taught that, quote, translated bodies cannot enter into rest until they have undergone a change equivalent to death." End of quote. Why are translated bodies necessary for future missions? Supporting scriptural documentation about John the Baptist. Although the documentation provided is more than adequate and compelling, the New Testament and modern revelation provide additional supporting evidence about the unique role and character of John the Baptist. 
full of the Holy Ghost while in his mother's womb. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Quote, and tell John, whom God raised up, being filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. End of quote. The above passages should be a clue to all of humanity that John the Baptist was unique from the rest of us. The scriptures inform us that mankind must receive the Holy Ghost upon the faith and repentance during mortality. The most likely way a person could be filled with the Holy Ghost before being born is if he had previously lived and received a fullness of the Holy Ghost in a previous life baptized while he was yet in the womb before he was born. When John was approached by Christ to be baptized, the Baptist exclaimed that he himself should be baptized of Christ. Yet Christ brushed off that declaration. There's no account of John being baptized during his New Testament sojourn. Why? Quote, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. End of quote. Doesn't it seem like a person would need to be baptized himself before he would be baptizing others? As it turns out, John was already baptized. DNC 8428 was altered to say that John was baptized in his childhood. The original revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith stated that John was baptized, baptized while he was yet in the womb. This would also explain why John was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. It's my belief that the intent of the verse was that he had been baptized prior to being born. Greatest prophet born of woman. Quote, but what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. End of quote. That is quite a bold statement for the Savior to make about John. Many gospel scholars have, no doubt, wondered how a lowly Levitical priest who got his head lopped off in the New Testament could have been greater than someone like the Old Testament prophet Elijah, who held the fullness of the priesthood and called fire down from heaven, produced numerous other miracles, and was translated and wafted to heaven in a chariot of fire. As demonstrated in this paper, the answer to that dilemma is provided in the inspired version of the Bible. Elijah's incredible condescension from the fearless and all-powerful Elijah in the Old Testament to a humble and persecuted forerunner of Christ in the New Testament is no doubt typological to God's ineffable condescension of allowing himself to take on the appearance of a man and be humiliated on the cross. He was the friend of the bridegroom, not part of the bride. Quote, Ye yourselves bear me witness, and that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. End of quote. Another invaluable clue regarding the true identity of John the Baptist is given by John himself in the above passage. Clearly, he perceived himself to be separate and distinct from the rest of those who are considered to be the bride of Christ. It's rather profound and significant that John does not categorize himself as being among those who represent the bride. Rather, he is the friend of the bridegroom. He's putting himself separate to and above the status of the bride and closer to the status of the bridegroom, is he not? A wealth of scriptural evidence has been presented in this rebuttal point to demonstrate Joseph and Oliver really did have the visitation documented in section 110. The Lord had commanded them to withhold prophetic information that proves Elijah had come in fulfillment to Malachi in 1829, and that section 110 is true. In my opinion, the documentation provided in this chapter that the Lord God of Israel has condescended to let us have is conclusive proof that John the Baptist is Elijah the prophet. I believe this proves beyond question that the declarations made by Elijah the prophet in section 110 were true and that the visitation of Christ and three other ministering angels 
was a true event. Quote, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealed this secret unto his servants, the prophets. End of quote. There are a multitude of reasons why the Lord might have commanded Joseph to not teach the secrets in the inspired version, and why he obviously commanded Joseph, Oliver, and Warren to not speak publicly about the visitation behind the veil. One of them may have been to try the faith of his people and to see who could be led astray by false teachers. Although I do not believe any further documentation is necessary to prove that section 110 is true, there are a few more items that I want to add to this final point. Other evidences that section 110 is true. The inspired version of the Bible reveals the grand secret that the Old Testament prophet Elijah the Tishbite was transmigrated to the meridian of time as the historical character known as John the Baptist. John was quite literally, quote, filled with the spirit of Elijah, end of quote, that had inhabited the Old Testament prophet Elijah. This means that when John the Baptist appeared to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery to reveal the priesthood by hand in 1829, Elijah the prophet was fulfilling the prophecy contained in the last few verses of Malachi. Remarkably, this proves that the declaration by Elijah in section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants is also true. The visitation of ministering angels in section 110 is, no doubt, one of the greatest prophetic fulfillments in the history of the world, and it all took place secretly. Section 110 is interconnected to many passages of Scripture. Although the event was to be kept hidden from the church and the world for a time, the Lord obviously instructed Joseph and Oliver to have the account recorded in a church diary enabling the truth to eventually come out. Once a student of the gospel realizes the grand secret that John the Baptist is the transmigration of Elijah the prophet and that the declarations uttered in section 110 are true, other passages of scripture will begin to emerge to provide additional witnesses of the veracity of section 110. Section 27 testifies of section 110, provides clarity to Malachi 110 and the doctrine of Elijah. When I first discovered the secret Elijah doctrine in the inspired version years ago, I looked for a way to debunk it. The thought that God would transmigrate an Old Testament prophet into the person of a New Testament figure seemed remarkable and difficult to believe. When I noticed a passage in tw section 27 that made it appear as if Elijah and John the Baptist were separate people, I decided not to write in my blog about how the inspired version teaches regarding the two individuals being the same, although I did make a few comments in the comments section of various posts. The evidence was overwhelmingly in favor of the two of them being the same, but I chose not to write any blogs or papers on the topic until I could understand the reason behind the apparent discrepancy. Nevertheless, the two passages in the inspired version, along with a mountain of supporting evidence, rang true to me. So I began to investigate a little deeper into the origin and original text of section 27. A composite of two revelations. <clears throat> According to Robert Woodford, section 27 is either a composite of two revelations or one revelation written in two parts. The uncertainty concerning its origin can be traced to two contemporary accounts. It appears these two revelations were combined for publication in the 1835 edition of the DNC. Restoring the original integrity to the text of section 27. As I began to dig a little deeper into section 27 and was able to look at earlier texts, the problem became obvious. The text would become distorted. Once the modern use of verses is removed and the earlier punctuation restored, the meaning is greatly transformed. Notice the first thing in grammar alterations as well as text deletion that's taken place in the modern version of section 27. Okay, starting at verse 6. And also with Elias, to whom I have committed the keys of bringing to pass the restoration of all things spoken, and then what's crossed out is, or the restorer of all things spoken. And that's the end of that. By the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began concerning the last days. And also John, the son of Zacharias, which Zacharias, he, Elias, visited and gave promise that he should have a son, and his name should be John. And he should be filled with the spirit of Elias, which John I have sent unto you, my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and Oliver Cowdery, to ordain you unto the first priesthood which you have received, that you might be called and ordained even as Aaron. And then you've got a semicolon instead of what should be a colon, and then a capital A here instead of a small A on and. And also Elijah, 
unto whom I have committed the keys of the power of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. In the 1833 Book of Commandments, the first part of what we now have as section 27 was published. It represents what the angel told Joseph as he was on his way to procure wine for the sacrament. In the 1835 DNC, both parts are published together, and in the 1851 publication of the Pearl of Great Price, only the second part is published. In both of those texts, verses 8 and 9 are actually part of the same sentence. A colon instead of a semicolon is used. It's not broken up into modern verses. The capital A on AND is a lowercase a. When restored to an earlier way the text was presented, the meaning completely changes. This is how two verses emerged as one verse in the 1851 edition of the Pearl of Great Price. And to you, my servants Joseph Smith, Jr., and Oliver Cowdery, to ordain you unto this first priesthood which you have received, that you might be called and ordained even as Aaron, and also Elijah, unto whom I have committed the keys of the power of turning the dot dot dot. As you can see, the two verses were originally one sentence. Elijah was not being presented as one of the characters who will be at the occasion of sharing the wine. Rather, the point being made in the narrative is that both the higher and lesser priesthood needed to be ordained by the laying on of hands, in the same manner that Aaron was ordained to the Aaronic priesthood, and that Elijah was ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood. This is a much needed clarification because when the Old Testament reveals that the Melchizedek priesthood is received by the calling of God's voice out of heaven, it does not include the fact that a physical ordination must accompany the heavenly call. Aaron and Elijah were being given as examples of how the reception of both the higher and lower priesthood involved the laying on of hands. One would think that the Melchizedek would have been chosen as the example for proper Melchizedek priesthood protocol since that priest was named after him. In hindsight, now that I understand that John the Baptist was Elijah the prophet, who also held the Melchizedek priesthood, it feels to me as if a cryptic witness is being offered of the fact that John was Elijah. Therefore, it was uniquely qualified to restore the Aaronic priesthood and also to teach Joseph and Oliver about the fourth calming Melchizedek priesthood. A few other observations about section 27. The final Elijah. The phrase, quote, Restore of all things spoken of by the mouth of all the holy prophets end of quote, is very significant. It distinguishes the mission of Elijah, the preparer, from the mission of Elijah, the restorer. It's not known why it was taken out in later publications. Quote, the keys of turning the hearts of the fathers, end of quote. It appears from verses 8 and 9 that Joseph and Oliver obtained the keys of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. The return of Elijah was all about transferring priesthood keys so that the Abrahamic promise could be fulfilled. In section 13, Elijah transferred the priesthood keys of the ministry of angels and of the gospel of repentance and of the baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, end of quote. In section 110, Elijah declared to Joseph and Oliver that, quote, the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, end of quote. Which dispensational keys? The priesthood keys to the ancient dispensation of the gospel of Abraham that had just been committed into the hands of Joseph and Oliver back in verse 12 of section 110. The priesthood given by Elijah to Joseph and Oliver in 1829 belonged to the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham that was secretly committed to Joseph and Oliver behind the veil in 1836. The Book of Abraham testifies of section 110. This ancient dispensation of the gospel of Abraham is linked to the ancient promise of God to Abraham that Abraham's posterity would be a blessing to all nations. This is done by taking the gospel to all nations. Priesthood keys needed to be transferred before the Gentiles rejected the fullness of the gospel, and the times of the Gentiles came to an end with a curse that would destroy the earth. Notice how the book of Abraham and section 110 have a reciprocal relationship of witnessing the veracity of each other while they provide the only two passages of scripture that reveal the mystery contained in Abraham 2, verses 9 and 10. Quote, and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the seed, sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. End of quote. That's in Genesis 22. God confirmed to Isaac 
that the promise would be fulfilled in chapter 26, quote, And I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and I'll give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. End of quote. That's in Genesis 26. The Old Testament informs us that the seed of Abraham would be blessed, all the nations of the earth, but it does not explain how. This dark secret's brought to light in Abraham 2, verses 9 and 10, and it's literally being fulfilled in section 110. Okay, on one side he's got one, um, see, on Abraham, and on the other, Abraham 2, and on the other side it's section 110. So here's section 110. After this, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, saying that in us and our seed, all generations after us should be blessed. Okay, over in uh, section, um, I mean in Abraham 2, is thou, and that's referring to Abraham, so Abraham, shall be a blessing to thy seed after thee, that in their hands they shall bear this ministry and priesthood unto all nations. And I will bless them through thy name, for as many as receive this gospel shall be called after thy name. So the words that match are gospel, Abraham, and blessed, or blessing. And then the other side, which is in Abraham, the, uh, uh, the two that are added are ministry and priesthood. The conferral of priesthood keys by Elijah in 1829 and Elijah's declaration of the transfer of the dispensational keys of the gospel of Abraham in 1836 all pertain to the fulfillment of the promise of God to Abraham that his posterity would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. We know from the ancient book of Abraham and modern revelation that this blessing is fulfilled by Abraham's seed as they take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations of the world. The restoration of priesthood and priesthood keys are made possible, the preaching of the gospel and joining the ancient saints with their posterity under the covenant. It was declared by Paul that, quote, they, the fathers, without us should not be made perfect, end of quote. Joseph would build upon this topic many times, quote, for their salvation is necessary and essential to our salvation, end of quote. As Paul says concerning the fathers, that they without us cannot be made perfect. Neither can we without our dead be made perfect. This is the true meaning behind the term of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. As you can see, section 27 in the book of Abraham both testify of the veracity of section 110. Hebrews 11:40. oddly, the verse is changed in the inspired version, yet Joseph continued to quote the original passage in his teachings, indicating that the original was still accurate. Section 110 is the corresponding response to section 109. One of the truly remarkable blind spots in the PTHG degradation of section 110 is that it never takes the obvious interconnectedness of section 110 with the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple into serious consideration. The Lord appears on the eighth day of the atonement offering. I pointed out in the other posts that the eighth day ceremony at the Kirtland Temple represented a set pattern and protocol that had been established by the Lord through Moses. The period beginning with the dedicatory prayer on March 27th to the secret visitation behind the veil, culminating the acceptance of the temple by Christ, and the visitation of three other heavenly messengers on the eighth day, April 3rd, represent a divine temple timeline pattern. It is clearly referenced in the Old Testament. That pattern is a silent witness that something very significant must have happened on the eighth day after the temple dedication. Quote, and ye shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days, until the days of your consecration be at the end. For seven days shall he consecrate you, as he hath done this day. So the Lord hath commanded to do, to make an atonement for you. Therefore shall ye abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord, that ye die not. For so I am commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. That's in Leviticus 8. And then, quote, It came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel and said unto Aaron, Take thee a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, 
Take ye a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and a calf for a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish, for a burnt offering, also a bullock and a ram for peace offerings, to sacrifice before the Lord, and a meat offering mingled with oil. For today the Lord will appear unto you. And they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded that ye should do. And the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. And Moses said unto Aaron, Go unto the altar, and offer thy sin offering and thy burnt offering, and make an atonement for thyself and for thy people, and offer the offering of the people, and make an atonement for them as the Lord commanded. Aaron was consecrated for the temple for seven days, and on the eighth day the Lord appeared to him to accept his atonement offering. This is quite remarkable. Anyone familiar with the above eight-day atonement protocol established by Moses, followed by the atonement statute prophecy in Leviticus 16, simply needs to prostrate themselves in jaw-dropping awe and reverence at the stupendous testimony of ancient temple protocol that was being demonstrated. This amazing prophetic pattern that secretly took place in the Kirtland Temple was evidenced by the emergence of the account contained in section 110. This account in conjunction with the dedicatory prayer and the events that took place between the first and eighth day of the Kirtland Temple festivities represents the literal fulfillment of the enactments presented in ancient scripture. Section 110 provides a point-by-point -point response to section 109. The secret visitation behind the veil on the eighth day following the dedicatory prayer could well be considered God's direct response to many of the specific petitions offered up in section 109. Listed below are a few of them, with snippets from section 109 on the left and 110 on the right. Okay, I'm just going to go straight across from section 109 to 110. So section 109, O Lord, accept of this house. And then in section 110 it says, Behold, I have accepted this house. Okay, the next line is the Son of Man might have a place to manifest himself. And then section 110, we saw the Lord. I will appear unto my servants. Next one, let the anointing of my ministers be sealed upon them. Put the, upon thy servants the testimony of the covenant. And that's all in section 109. So section 110, how that was answered the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. Okay, in section 109 again, deliver thy people from the calamity of the wicked. And then in section 110, the answer to it, turn the hearts, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. Okay, on the section 109 side, that all the ends of the earth may know that we, thy servants, have heard thy voice and that thou hast sent us. Now on the uh, 110 side, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah. Okay, over on the 109 side, when thy people transgress any of them, they may speedily repent. Forgive the transgressions of thy people. Over in section 110, behold, your sins are forgiven you. On the 109 side, and also this church to put upon it thy name. And then in section 110, and my name shall be here. 109 side, that from among all these thy servants, the sons of Jacob, may gather out the righteous. And on the 110 side, committed unto us the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth. The 109 side, that it may be sanctified and consecrated to be holy, and that thy holy presence may be continually in this house. Then on the 110 side, and do not pollute this holy house. As you can see, section 109 was the petition of the saints given by revelation. O Lord, accept this house. Section 110 was the response. Behold, I have accepted this house. Given the intricate correlation between the petitions in section 109 and the responses given in 110 provided in the graph above, in, con in conjunction with the backdrop already provided in this paper, it becomes apparent that section 109 and 110 are inseparably connected. One cannot accept 109 without accepting the validity and count interconnectedness of 110. They are like matching bookends. Remarkably, the dedicatory prayer foretells that the work will be, quote, cut short in righteousness, end of quote. Later in this chapter, we'll discuss how the initial gospel ministry to the Gentiles was, quote, cut short in righteousness as a result of the mercy that was extended above.
the mercy seat when the divine intervention behind the veil took place. Remarkably, both a curse and a blessing were being bestowed at the same time as foretold in Deuteronomy. Quote, and it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. And that's in Deuteronomy 30. The curse that was going forth to destroy the earth was brought on by the fact that the fullness of the gospel had been rejected by the Gentiles. This made them worthy of being destroyed off the face of the earth, just as ancient Israel was going to be destroyed by God until Moses intervened. The blessing came in the form of mercy. An intervention and the rebuking of the destroyer, who had already been sent forth, secretly took place, which prevented Latter-day Israel from being swept off the earth. This transaction involved the extending of an ancient dispensation with a preparatory priesthood and gospel. The good news is that at some time in the future, after the secret bestowal of the blessing and the cursing upon Israel was administered, the Lord will take away the captivity of Latter-day Israel and will gather his people from among the nations. This last great gathering will begin after the first laborers of the last kingdom return to finish their prophetic stewardships. Because of the events relating to the secret visitations behind the veil, the worldwide curse that was to destroy the earth as prophesied by Malachi and Isaiah was delayed. The reason the work needed to be cut short in righteousness by an acceptable atonement offering leading up to its fulfillment behind the veil is because of the, quote, calamity of the wicked, end of quote, mentioned in the dedicatory prayer. That's also uh, mentioned, by the way, in section 1. The response to the calamity provided in section 110 was that the curse would be delayed by an offering made by Joseph Smith and his associates. The offering had been prophesied in section 84, quote, For the sons of Moses and also the sons of Aaron shall offer an acceptable offering and sacrifice in the house of the Lord, which house shall be built unto the Lord in this generation, upon the consecrated spot as I have appointed. And the sons of Moses and of Aaron shall be filled with the glory of the Lord upon Mount Zion in the Lord's house. End of quote. That offering would be made possible by the return of Elijah the prophet and the restoration of the priesthood keys enabling the ushering in of the fulfillment of the atonement statute from the ancient dispensation that was committed to Joseph and Oliver. The restoration of the Levitical priesthood in section 13 would enable the curse to be delayed and the preparatory gospel to go forth once the fullness of the gospel had been rejected. Although the Levitical priesthood can only produce cursings and not blessings, the preaching of the gospel to the nations of the earth by the designated seed of Abraham would nevertheless result in turning the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers in preparation for when the light of the fullness of the gospel would shine forth during the marvelous work. The Lord would rebuke the destroyer that had been sent forth, delaying the curse from smiting the entire earth. Quote, lest the whole earth be smitten with the curse. End of quote. That divine intervention included an atonement offering by jo Joseph Smith, Jr., who, according to section 109, has covenanted with Jehovah and vowed to thee. That's in DNC 109, verse 68. The covenant and vow that Joseph made with Jehovah is briefly mentioned in other passages, including section 124, quote, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Joseph Smith, I am well pleased with your offering and acknowledgments. Uh, and in section 84 speaks of a covenant that's been, quote, renewed and confirmed, end of quote, upon the leading high priesthood that was not for their sakes, but for the sake of the whole world, end of quote. This intercessory covenant was no doubt typological to the atonement that Moses and Aaron made on behalf of ancient Israel, quote, therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath lest he should destroy them, end of quote. That's in Psalm 106. As you can see, the dedicatory prayer contained in section 109 and the corresponding secret visitation behind the veil as recorded in section 110 are inseparably connected with each other and they have to do with the fulfillment of the prophecy given by Moses in Deuteronomy. Section 109 is one of the many revelations that testifies of the truthfulness of section 110. Many more evidences 
of the validity of Section 110 are contained in the scriptures. We will be reviewing more of them in future posts. The Keys to Gather Israel Two Patriarchs Blessings Testify of Section 110 conveniently omitting the other three visitations from the discussion. Some of the revelatory talking points within the dedicatory prayer remind us that the declaration of Elijah constitutes a very small part of section 110. This brings to mind yet another blind spot of PTHG in its attempt to cause doubt in the historicity of section 110. While the author hyper-focuses on the declaration of Elijah, and his indigestion over the Elijah doctrine of the modern church, he completely neglects the significance of the other three visitations and the associated evidence of those narratives. He negates the profound utterances of Christ, Moses, and Elias in his attempt to take issue with the prophetic utterances of Elijah. As demonstrated in the previously itemized snippets contained in section 109 and the patriarchal blessing that Joseph received from his father just prior to section 110, there is powerful testimony of the truthfulness of section 110 relating to the visitation of the other three messengers. Another example of this relates to the visitation of Moses and the keys of the gathering of Israel. Moses and the Keys of the Gathering, the Patriarchal Blessings of Joseph Smith. Having touched briefly on the significance of the visitation of Christ and Elias, we will now make mention of the visitation of Moses. The gathering of the theology is interwoven throughout modern revelation, and the first elders of the church had been promised that they were called to eventually, quote, bring to pass the gathering of the elect unto one place to prepare their hearts, end of quote, against the, quote, day of tribulation, end of quote. For this reason, the keys of the gathering of Israel needed to be committed. Since there's no place other than section 110 where such a transaction is documented, we have one more evidence supporting the authenticity of the section. It's no coincidence that within the previous year, Joseph Smith had received two separate and distinct patriarchal blessings from two separate patriarchs, and each blessing makes reference to his role in gathering Israel. A blessing given by his father on the 9th of December, 1834, alluded to Joseph's calling to gather the remnants from among the Gentiles and restored the tribes of Israel. The second blessing given to Oliver Cowdery on the 22nd of September, 1835, foretells that, quote, by the keys of the kingdom shall he lead Israel into the land of Zion. End of quote. It certainly appears that Joseph needed the keys of the gathering of Israel committed to him. Section 110 fits snugly in place and, therefore, provides yet another contextual evidence. There are no doubt numerous other connections relating to the visitation of Moses. An entire paper could be prepared focusing on the significance of the countless evidences pertaining to the three visitation narratives in Section 110 that PTHG completely skips over. That PTHD is the book Passing the Heavenly Gift that he keeps referring to. Section 112 testifies of section 110. Section 112.32 is our next example of a scriptural dot that connects with section 110. Notice the following passage in section 112, which was given on July the 23rd, 1837. Quote, For unto you the twelve and those the first presidency who are appointed with you to be your counselors and your leaders is the power of this priesthood given for the last days and for the last time in which is the dispensation of the fullness of times, which power you hold in connection with all those you've received who have received a dispensation at any time from the beginning of the creation. For verily I say unto you, the keys of the dispensation which ye have received have come down from the fathers, and last of all being sent down from heaven unto you. So that's section 112. Isn't that amazing? Verse 32 of section 112 simply doesn't make any sense without section 110. What dispensation is it referring to that has been given to the restored church? Clearly, it's not referring to the keys of the dispensation of the fullness of times held by Peter, James, and John because it was never even ushered in during Joseph's ministry. It is clearly not referring to the keys of the dispensation of the last times because it began with the Meridian Apostles 2,000 years previous. According to Joseph Smith in the scriptures, the dispensation of the gospel of Jesus Christ of the end times was in the process of being rejected. In a later part of this chapter, we will discuss the rejection of the gospel by the Jews and then the Gentiles. The above keys of a dispensation that had been given to the twelve apostles and had been passed down from the fathers remains mysterious and difficult to explain if one rejects the validity of section 110. That verse is making specific reference to the dispensational keys that had been given to Joseph and Oliver in secret. Quote, After this, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, 
saying that in us and our seed all generations after us should be blessed. Only section 110 provides the explanation regarding the dispensation passed down from the fathers to which section 112 makes reference. This makes section 112 another contextual evidence of the truthfulness of 110. Section 124 testifies that section 110 is true. Embedded in section 124 is a remarkable reference to the secret visitation behind the veil that is described in section 110. And from this time forth I appointed to him, brackets, Hiram, into bracket, that he may be a prophet and a seer and a revelator into my church, as well as my servant Joseph, that he may act in concert also with my servant Joseph, and that he shall receive counsel from my servant Joseph, who shall show unto him the keys whereby he may ask and receive, and be crowned with the same blessing and glory and honor and priesthood and gifts of the priesthood that once were put upon him that was my servant Oliver Cowdery. Uh, and that's DNC 124. Can anyone produce a documented event in the life of Oliver Cowdery other than the one described in section 110 that fits the descriptives of blessing, glory, honor, priesthood, and the gifts of the priesthood? The keys jointly shared by Joseph and Oliver. It is an amazingly cohesive narrative that we have Joseph and Oliver kneeling beside each other, receiving the keys to an ancient priesthood containing the keys to the ministry of angels in 1829, and again in 1834, five years later, they jointly enter into the covenant of tithing for the continuation of blessings. Then, in 1836, they were kneeling beside each other for a third time, receiving the ministration of angels and being visited again by Elijah who makes prophetic reference to the last time he visited these two servants of the Lord. Yet the reception of the Aaronic priesthood was kept secret for years. The covenant of tithing was little more than a quiet footnote in the history of the church that few people knew about. And the vision behind the veil was, in the words of Daniel, sealed up and kept secret. Outwardly, contextually confusing. Although the secret behind the scenes narrative is consistent with the doctrinal point of view, it makes no sense from a surface contextual view of church history. Indeed, it seems somewhat disjointed and out of sync with the events of church history. It seems odd that Oliver was the one participating in the covenant of tithing, and even more curious that he was the one behind the veil with Joseph, because before those two events took place, Sidney Rigdon had long since joined the church and had largely replaced Cowdery in prominence and pertinence. It was Rigdon that replaced Cowdery as Joseph's scribe in translating the Bible. Rigdon was participating in the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood at Morley Farm, while Cowdery was oddly missing. It was Rigdon who taught at the School of the Prophets, and Rigdon who sat by the side of Joseph Smith during the vision known as Section 76. It was Rigdon who was given the privilege of dedicating the place of the temple in Jackson County. Indeed, the references, promises, and privileges of Cowdery in modern revelation pale in comparison to those of Rigdon. Rigdon and Smith were virtually inseparable during the years leading up to the dedication of the temple while Cowdery was fading into the background. Rigdon was clearly more engaged in overseeing the building of the Kirtland Temple than Cowdery. Tales of Rigdon pacing back and forth on top of the temple, petitioning the Lord in tears are legend. It is Rigdon that emerges as the primary speaker at the dedication. All things considered, Joseph's obvious choice of a companion behind the veil would have been Rigdon, not Cowdery. Yet the remarkable cohesive behind-the-scenes narrative called for Oliver to participate in all three of the key events leading up to and including the secret visitation behind the veil. And that is evidence that God was directing things, not Joseph. It appears that Oliver and Sidney had two very different stewardships. Oliver and Joseph had a secret. As previously noted in other posts, Joseph Smith had been forbidden by the Lord to teach out of the inspired version of the Bible until it had been canonized with another book of scripture, and was ready to be sent to the world. He was forced to keep several things secret. This is undoubtedly true with some of his closest associates. Both Oliver and Sidney helped with the translation of the Bible and were undoubtedly aware of some of the great prophetic secrets. Oliver obviously knew that the angel who ordained him in Joseph in 1829 was the same angel that secretly visited them behind the veil in the temple in 1836. It's interesting that after the secret visitation behind the veil was eventually revealed, the true identity of Elijah continued to be withheld. It is very possible that Oliver's criticism of Joseph shortly after the visitation had to do with Oliver's understanding of the prophecies contained in Malachi in relation to the Latter-day apostasy of the church and some of the disconcerting things he saw taking place with Joseph and the church. He may even have been aware of the atonement statute and the implications that it would have upon the outward actions of Joseph. 
Cowdery Leaves the Church. Oliver Cowdery was excommunicated at Far West on April 12th of 1838, right at the time when a string of revelations were being received by Joseph Smith. It's unlikely Oliver was unaware of these revelations, yet he was obviously unimpressed enough with them and Joseph's conduct to remain unrepentant and estranged from the church for many years thereafter. When Oliver Cowdery and his brother-in-law David Whitmer were interviewed at the same time by Thomas March about leaving the church, they both expressed their belief that Joseph was a fallen prophet. They remained convinced that they would yet play a future role when the great work begins again. Nevertheless, something eventually happened to Oliver that caused an amazing change of heart. It appears as epiphany could not be shared with his brother-in-law of David Whitmer. This change of heart may well have taken place when Oliver Cowdery was confronted with section 124. He may well have been convicted in his heart that Joseph still had the gift of prophecy when he viewed the content in 124. There is reason to believe it was after reading 124 that he desired to return to the church. Previously, Cowdery had expressed to David Whitmer that he felt they had priesthood keys giving them the right to preside over the other splinter groups. Quote, True it is that our right gives us the head, end of quote, and, quote, we have the authority and do hold the keys, end of quote. Yet he later declared that section 124 changed his mind. Quote, when I wrote that letter, I did not know of the revelation, DNC 124, which says that the keys and power conferred upon me were taken from me and placed upon the head of Hiram Smith, and it was that revelation which changed my views on this subject, end of quote. Evidently, during their private discussions with Oliver in late October of 1848, Orson Hyde and George A. Smith made him aware of the January 1841 revelation. Why did Oliver accept section 124 when he had previously rejected sections 115 to 119? There could have been numerous factors. I would suggest that verse 95, which conferred the same blessings upon Hiram that had previously been placed upon Oliver, provided undeniable proof to Oliver that the revelation was valid. Quote, and this is in brackets, let Hiram, end of brackets, and be crowned with the same blessing and glory and honor and priesthood and gifts of the priesthood that once were put upon him that was my servant, Oliver Cowdery, end of quote. That's DNC 124. Contemporary members of the church back at that time reading those passages would have been unaware of the secret visitation behind the veil. They must have thought the following descriptives were overkill, if not unwarranted for someone who had simply been ordained to be the assistant president of the church. Blessing, glory, honor, priesthood, gifts of the priesthood. When had Oliver been given blessing, glory, honor, priesthood, and gifts of the priesthood? That passage was certainly referring to something more than the bestowal of the Aaronic priesthood and his priesthood ordination as the assistant president of the church. No other revelation received by Joseph Smith up to that time had bestowed such incredible accolades upon one of God's servants. I believe that, had the secret visitation behind the veil been made public, the passage would have been interpreted by the saints as having reference to the visitation. It apparently had a significant impact on Oliver Cowdery. It appears that he got the message loud and clear. He knew full well those cryptic descriptives were indicative of and explicitly describing the secret event of the Kirtland Temple, wherein he and Joseph were jointly given the keys of the gathering of Israel, the dispensation of the Gospel of Abraham, and the remarkable promise that in Joseph and Oliver, all the seed of Joseph and Oliver and all generations after them would be blessed. Clearly, section 124, verse 95, refers to and testifies of the validity of section 110. Following Oliver's reading of section 124, a very different Oliver Cowdery emerged. Unlike the angry and arrogant Cowdery who left the church, a very humble and contrite Cowdery begged for re-entry, and he emphasized that he was not expecting nor seeking position, just membership. The Ring and the Robe Back in April 1843, Joseph directed that a letter be written to Oliver in Missouri. He instructed that the letter ask if Oliver had, quote, eaten husks long enough, end of quote. This was an unmistakable reference to the parable of the prodigal son, who, after squandering all his inheritance, was sent to the fields to feed the swine, where, quote, he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that swine did eat, end of quote, and that's in Luke 15. Oliver was cryptically being reminded that he and Joseph had jointly received priesthood keys, a priesthood dispensation, and the same promise regarding the posterity and future generations that Abraham had received. Joseph directed that the letter ask Oliver if he was almost ready to return and be clothed with the robes of righteousness. 
According to the parable that Joseph was quoting from, the prodigal son was restored to his former position and given the ring and the robe. Quote, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. End of quote. In my opinion, section 124 is the one of the most powerful testimonies that section 110 is true. Regardless of whether it was the epiphany that changed Oliver's heart, I believe that verse 95 is referring to the blessing, glory, honor, priesthood, and gifts of the priesthood that Oliver and Joseph received on April 3rd of 1836. Curiously, although the event documented in section 110 is very difficult to document through empirical historical evidence, it's probably the most verified event when viewed contextually at the content in other scriptures that refer to it.